everyone. Thank you very much to both for that uh, really touching uh, introduction. I should say to, um, to, to Dan that, that Cyprus had the same rule about uh, stamps, and they, a friend of mine who was sitting in the room where they were talking whether to do it or not said the um, chairman of the room asked, should, should we wait until he dies before we put him on a stamp? <laughs> <laughs> and then they decided uh, that to, to give up the rule, which applied everywhere in, in Cyprus, actually, you cannot name a street after an alive person. Whereas when presidents die, then uh, each and every village and town in the island gets his name on a, on a street, and you cannot, um, you cannot have statues and other things of alive people, which, which I don't understand this, this rule. But um, I'm surprised to hear that even in the States, you, even in the States you have the same, uh, uh, the same rule. But anyway, let's, uh, <coughs> let's hope things change, they pay more. Um, they do more things for alive people as well. <laughs> um, now, my topic today is uh, working in the age of uh, robots and AI. It's a topic that I've uh, been um, thinking about a lot in the implications, especially the sort of policy implications, what changes are coming to labor markets. And, and little, little by little, it's, it's growing around you. It's amazing how much interest there is in this topic now. I mean, in London, uh, we just set up, we had, approved, we had approval for an institute, which we call the Institute for the Future of Work which is main, mainly non-academic, mainly to uh, advise policymakers about the uh, structural changes coming uh, to labor markets. I'm heading it with um, an engineer. And, um, and only yesterday I got uh, an, an invitation from the Vatican Academies where they're very concerned about the future of work and they're having a conference next uh, spring in the Vatican about robots and what they do. As you will see much later on, they are, they are one of the two or three professions that they should be least worried about their job being taken over by robots. <laughs> so I don't know why they're so concerned about it. But it's all um, exciting work. Excuse me, actually. I think so. it, it, it's all exciting. I mean, there are exciting things happening, so that I hope the excitement is more than, than concern. So there are, there are obviously concerns because there are changes coming to labor markets and we're not sure where they're coming, and I hope that, the, that what I'm going to say will shed uh, some light on it. These are the things I'm going to say. There's obviously a lot, a lot more there than the 50 minutes remaining. Uh, for, for the talk, I mean, like, very briefly, I'm going to say what, um, it, what it involves and uh, how much industrial penetration there's been. Uh, then uh, talk more generally about the impact of um, new technology on labor markets. And then, of course, every, it, it's obligatory that every talk I have has job creation and job destruction in it, so there's a topic, there's a heading job destruction in the age of, job, of robots. And where I put more emphasis, actually, being a, a naturally optimistic and positive person is the job creation that is coming with the age of robots. Then, if we have time, I want to talk more about the health and care sector because I think that's, that's going to be the biggest job creation sector that uh, cannot be taken over by robots. If there are any Japanese people here, I hope you excuse me because I know that there are some robot nurses in Japan, even not only on, for diagnosis. Um, and finally, I guess, <laughs> given what Hilmar said about the interests of Isa Day, how can policy help in the age of robots, which is usually a section where we run out of time and say, if you're interested, look, look it up on the, web, <laughs> on the website or something, but I hope we do get to that. Uh, now, first, what ro robots are they, and that, what, what do I mean, you know, what am I going to have in mind when I talk about robots? And what I have is something that you probably heard about did many times. It's, it's automation in the industry, self-driving cars, electronic passport gates, you know, and um, all the, you know, the voices that you talk to your phone and asses back to you. All, all these are examples of artificial intelligence. There is some data being analyzed behind every time you do it, you know, to use the example of uh, passports. Passport gates at, at airports, essentially what you do is that you stand in front of a camera and then you put your passport on a scan machine and, uh, and, there, is some, uh, and there is a comparison behind where, where they compare the picture that the camera takes of you and also the passport and if they're the same, then the gates open and you walk through. Well, for that to work, you need lots and lots of data behind. How do you compare faces in, from two different sources? You know, that's what we mean by artificial intelligence essentially. Um, 
The reason there is so much concern about robotics now, because research in this started in the 1950s. In 1958, in fact, the US government gave a grant for research on robots and artificial intelligence. In 1968, they produced a volume, the Council of Economic Advisors, which was talking about disruption in labor markets. Probably not using this terminology, but that's what it was about which is very similar to the volume they produced three or four years ago as well. So you might ask, why suddenly this interest? Well, I, I think one of the key differences is that, um, is that now we have a lot more data. I mean, da data is the key, as you will see later on as well. But also technology has improved to the extent that that data could be fed onto independently moving devices, which are the robots. Whereas the robots of the 1950s and 60s were screwed to the floor and they were just moving arms on assembly lines, whereas now they're, they're independent and they move around and they can do things. <coughs> and, and that's been very important for industry and services. So how much industrial penetration has there been? Well, it's very difficult to tell how much uh, artificial intelligence there is, but it's much easier to count the number of robots that work in, in industry. If we, there's an example of that. So recently, Amazon employs 45,000 robots in their warehouses um, that work together with people. You know, it's, it, because they're freely moving devices, it's, it's easy to count them. And there is the International Robotics Society, I think it's called, something similar, where they do publish data on um, the use of robots in industry. And there's been a lot of growth in, uh, in recent years, but it's obvious when you see it and when you hear all the talk about it, you might say, well, is that what all the fuss is about? Well, the reason is that there's a lot more coming. Now, of course, what, uh, I don't know how familiar you are, you are with all this, but the country that is really taken on by robotics and uh, producing them by the uh, carload is, is China. Where they, where they move from low-wage manufacturing and, and, uh, and, and exports, they miss the middle stage where uh, wages go up, you have more technology in your industry, and now they jumped onto uh, frontier competing with uh, Japan, Germany, and the United States on uh, artificial intelligence and, and, and robotics, and, and you see it here. I mean, the top line is, is what's in the entire world, but the red line is mainly China. I mean, it says Australia and... Um, and Asia there, but it's, it's mainly China and, and, and Southeast. And then below it's uh, the whole of Europe and then United States. You can see in Europe and the United States going parallel. Um, not any spectacular uh, increases in the use of robotics, but, but, but in China there's, uh, there's been a jump since um, about 2010 is when their policy changed from low wage labor and migration from the countryside to high technology, that's where they shifted the emphasis. And of course, being China, it only takes the party secretary to say that's what you should be doing, and the whole of industry switches and does it, especially when your secretary is Mr. Xi. Um, there is a lot of direction from government, in other words. Uh, okay, now there are also big differences uh, between countries. Here, I mean, I don't know how uh, surprised you've been, but the, but the, the, the leaders here is where are um, South Korea, Japan, and Germany. Um, maybe it's a little surprising that Italy, Sweden, Czech Republic, Slovakia have more than uh, UK and China. Of course, it's way, way down. That's why it's growing so fast. Um, but, um, and, also, and also people usually talk about Estonia being the most digital, digitalized country in Europe. But in fact, when it comes to robotics, uh, they're down at the bottom with uh, Iceland. Um, I guess the Europeans are there because wages are so expensive in Europe that when you can use a robot, you tell you don't use it. Um, but, um, but, but here it is. I mean, they were moving that S South Korea is... Well, also South Korea, Japan, Germany are also top in R&D, which is where these new developments come from. But there is really no correlation with uh, other countries and uh, R&D. Um, there, is really, there is really not enough R&D, especially in Europe. I, didn't, I, I don't want to go along that direction because it will take a lot of time. So I just want to show you the, uh, the graph here. Is Israel actually is up there as well. I don't know why. I think they're missing from this data set. But it's quite remarkable how, how much South Korea has uh, achieved and where they were in the 1950s and 
and where they are now in almost every measure of technology that, uh, that you, that you uh, care to look at. Okay, let's move to the impact of the technology in, in, um, on labor markets. Now, of course, you know, the, the way the restructuring of labor markets in response to technology is not new. It's, it's always there. You know, it's what's known as the structural transformation. The biggest trans structural transformation, in fact, is you run out of agriculture. You know, you have 60, 70% of your labor force working in agriculture, you go through an industrial revolution, and, and you end up with about 10% working in agriculture, which is what happened to China in the last 30 years, for example, is what happened in Europe in 1950s, 60s, uh, and the United States 50 years earlier. The, um, the, the, the reason for that is that the technology, new technology hits differently, different sectors of economic activity, and, and, and so you have to have a restructuring of jobs so that you balance out the output demands of, of the population. You know, in the extreme case, if a population wants to consume output in fixed proportions, then obviously employment has to respond one-to-one one one for technology so that uh, you offset any changes in productivity that are coming from technology through numbers of, of workers. Um, Britain, as we know, went through the first industrial revolution. What disrupted labor markets then was steam power, the canals, and the factories. Uh, the jobs that were destroyed were skilled at that time. They were the artisans. They all lost their jobs. The artisans would take a piece of wood and turn it into a beautiful piece of furniture. That thing disappeared completely. It was all done in factories. That, that's the first major uh, disruption that was observed in the world. Then we have the industrialization of the 19th century, is the car, the railways, uh, electricity that disrupted even more. <clears throat> uh, the jobs that were um, destroyed were mainly unskilled, and that's what has been left in our mind, that technology usually uh, uh, destroys unskilled jobs, but that's not the case. It was only the case at that time. And um, the... Um, you can see how much disruption the, the car brought. This is the Bank of England, just before the introduction of the motor car. And that's how transportation in London was. There was uh, they were very concerned at that time in London because they said the way it's going and all this congestion of horses that you see, the whole of the city will be covered in horse manure and what are we going to do about it? Um, obviously, that's, uh, that never materialized. But what, the reason I want to show you a picture of this kind is that we forget how much disruption came to labor markets at that time. I don't think robots will cause this kind of change. You know, I don't think we're going to have... I mean, all, all these people you see there are, are workers that are in the bank in the center of London. And they all lost their jobs because of the discovery of the, of the internal combustion engine. I, I, I don't think there are robots that will bring this kind of disruption. It's good to see it all in context. You know, don't panic, in other words. You know, it's, they're not coming to take all our jobs. Um, then... Um, the, um, this is also a bit of history that um, I will show you. You probably know these things, actually, so I'm going to move a, a bit faster. I mean, like industrial employment really increased in the beginning of the 20th century because of electricity and because of all the uh, electrical goods that were produced, you know, this sort of Bob Gordon's big uh, thesis about uh, growth. But uh, come the 70s and 80s with the um, uh, reduction, with the... Uh, drop in the rate of growth, we have a continuous decline in industrial employment. You can see here Germany and the United States, two of the um, most advanced industrial countries. How it is, it, It's a linear, well, exponential actually, a linear uh, decrease in um, industrial employment. And I put against them China, which is the new emerging industrial power, and you can see that there is changing as well. Where, where you see the, the turning there is not just one year. I mean, it's, it, it's expected to continue like that when you see what's uh, happening in, in, in the country. So the question is, where is industrial employment going to go? Well, it, it's going to go to where agriculture, well, I suspect, it's only about, it only employs about 2 to 3% of the labor force, and we produce more food than, uh, than we need. And, and probably the same will happen with industrial employment and, and robotics. Uh, the only difference is that industrial employment now is employing about 15%. You know, it's not the end of the world, but... Uh, it will all be reflected in, the, in service employment growth. <coughs> now, switching now to, um, can I get some water from there? Sir? 
like that. <coughs> oh, sorry, th sorry, there's some, yeah, but there's no, no glass. So. No, yes, yes. I hope so, yeah. Yes. <coughs> Now, the, um, the way to look now at um, AI and uh, robotics is that the latest technology that is going to uh, disrupt. And what I'm going to look through now is what kind of disruption is coming, how does it compare with previous ones, and what can we do uh, about it. Now, the, um, the, the job destruction that is coming, the disruption that is coming, is affecting mainly skilled people now, not, not the unskilled. Um, and um, and as we know from the work of David Otter, especially, and others, it is mainly skilled people in the middle of the, um, of the skills distribution. The, 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 the key property of jobs that are being re replaced by AI and robotics is that, um, is that they are working in predictable environments. You know, they, they, you know, they're based on data, in other words. You know, you know that if you have all the data, you know what decision is going to be made. It's, they're routine jobs that simply process data and come out with um, action, with decisions. And that's what uh, robots are good at when they have the big data and the artificial intelligence. Now, those jobs are, are in the middle. I have some examples later on. Let me not try and jump here where I talk more uh, specifically. Now, the um, it, it issue here is that what's the... Uh, main problem that we're facing with that is not the fact that those jobs have been lost. There is an, there is an increase in productivity when those jobs are lost. I mean, just, just imagine the, um, you know, say the, the disappearance of a typist, which is a, a skilled job. I mean, you know, we had typists, our typists at least at the university that we had, the typing pool had university degrees. But they, what they were doing was very, was predictable. You know, once they knew what they had to write, you knew how to write it. Now there is voice recognition, you lose those jobs. Well, well productivity improves, it's a good thing. The, the, the key challenge there is how do you um, re-employ re the typists that used to be uh, employed in that particular profession. So the challenge is the transition to new jobs. It's not the fact that uh, the job has gone and and we've gone and uh, we're going to be unemployed for the rest uh, of our lives, and that's what I will, I'll emphasize uh, later on uh, as well. Um, the uh, first bunch of jobs that were lost, and, and, and the reason they were lost by computerization, uh, are mainly in the middle, as I, as I said. Now, top jobs benefited from that because they are complementary to computers. They use them to increase their productivity and their pay. Middle jobs get the negative shock because they work in predictable environments, most of them, and, they, and um, they, they, there is sort of job destruction as well. And the, and, and the bottom jobs, that what I was saying, uh, are really ones unaffected by computerization. They don't use computers. They don't, the services they're providing, you know, if they're cleaners, janitors, uh, service uh, uh, providers, unskilled service providers. Uh, they are still there. And you can see here the origins of the rising inequality that we see in many countries, including Germany, in fact, almost as much as the United States from what I know, which is that, um, that, that computers help the top end of the wage distribution because they're complementary to those highly skilled people. They, the middle range sort of you open a hole because you get the negative shock and then the bottom one is unaffected and therefore you get the widening of wage differentials which is a problem that, um, that we're not sure quite how to deal with it, it's still ongoing and, um, and, and there is expectation from all those who look at the data that there will be more job destruction in the middle of the skills distribution and therefore wages at the middle are still under threat that they will go down. Um, and, and again, what do you do with that? And I have some remarks like, like right at the end if we get to that uh, point about inequality and the big problem. But I do think, though, that, uh, that probably the biggest challenge for economic theory as well to develop the theories as well as practice is, is, how, is what to do to understand inequality better and to understand 
what it means if we use policy, if you like, to um, compress the wage distribution, which is something we don't understand very well yet. Um, now, the um, reason that, um, sorry, the, the, the reason there is a big divergence amongst the estimates we have about how much job destruction is coming is that it's very difficult to talk about jobs in this um, uh, situation here. What's much easier to talk about is tasks, you know, to take sort of individual tasks that people perform, like I mentioned typing before, or you could be, as I show you later on, you could be a, a lawyer's assistant who spends uh, all his time in a library looking at, um, at books, you know, that's a particular task. But jobs usually do many task, tasks. And the estimates we have about job destruction, they're not really estimates about job destruction, they are um, estimates of, of, of the probability of a task being uh, um, taken over by AI. And um, Frey and Osborne in Oxford, at the University of Oxford produced these estimates uh, early on, I think they were probably the first ones. A telemarketer is the one that um, sells on the telephone, and obviously uh, they've already been replaced because we now buy on the internet rather than pick up the phone and order. There's very, very little um, uh, retail activity done on the phone. Loan officer is the one who evaluates all your personal data and decides whether you are credit worthy. Again, they're no use now. You enter all your uh, details on the computer and within a minute, in fact, I was at a meeting organized by Alibaba in, uh, in, in China uh, earlier this week, on Monday, and, and they said it takes three, three seconds to tell you, to tell you, if, you are, if you can get a loan. Once you enter your, all your details in, you get an answer within three seconds. So obviously no person can process that data so quickly. You get a yes or no. Legal assistants are the ones who just read all cases to tell the uh, lawyer what decisions were made under what circumstances. Again, the lawyer enters the keywords on the computer and the answer comes up. And, uh, and, and self-driving uh, cars and all that. Now, you can see that the jobs that have least probability of going down, they're all, it, it, they're all involving social and emotional skills, as we call them there. It's the mental health social worker, is the safest job. You cannot rely on a robot to um, give you comforts if you are mentally disturbed for whatever reason, the occupational therapist, the dietitian, doctor and surgeon and clergy, as I was saying before, you can, I, I don't know why the probability of, I don't know why there is a 0.8 probability of the clergy being taken over by artificial <laughs> intelligence, actually. <laughs> but 0.8 is below 1%, so I guess you can assume that that's uh, zero. Um, we, which is going to come later on as well. You can see that the, that the predictable, the ones that, jobs that are done with data, are disappearing and, and jobs that, that use social skills and emotional skills have very low probability of, uh, of destruction in the current technological uh, waves. So then the question is how do, you go, how do you map those tasks onto jobs? Well, some people ignore that mapping and they're saying, oh, within the next 30 years we're going to lose half our jobs. Well, that's completely un untrue. Um, uh, others like the OECD is the most conservative. They say, you know, all these, all these tasks that would be lost, at most 10% of jobs would be destroyed. The other jobs would just restructure, change the composition of tasks they do. Uh, I mean, the McKinsey study was careful. It's, it's a little booklet they published a few months ago. It's uh, fairly careful that they came up with 14%, which is closer to the uh, OECD. But that, that's the sort of uh, reason that we come up with different estimates. You, you can see the um, restructuring of jobs. I mean, bank, bank tellers, in the American terminology at least, bank cashiers, as we call them, in, in Britain, I mean, their, their jobs have changed completely. You know, 15 years ago, you walked into a bank with a check. That, that, what they mainly did was that people walked with a check, they took it in, and they gave you cash. That's why they're called cashiers. Now you cannot even cash with a check, even if you want to. They look at you suspiciously and they tell you, let me call the manager, what are you doing here? <laughs> because there are ATM machines everywhere and if you cannot use an ATM machine, it means there's something, something else in your mind that they're less suspicious about. And, and yet, employment of, um, of front office bank cashiers in branches ha hasn't declined at all. There are still the same branches and the same people behind there. 
The reason is that they do what, um, in the, what in the banking industry is called uh, relationship banking. You know, you walk in and they ask you, they look at your account and they ask you, you know, are you sure your money is in the right place here? You know, you could get 0.51% more if you shift it all here, there. And, um, and you give us a nice commission as well in the process. <laughs> they, they, in other words, they tell you about your uh, savings, about your portfolio reallocations. They offer you coffee. They now have nice Nespresso machines everywhere in, in bank branches. Um, and, and, um, and that's what we mean by job restructuring. It's the, I mean, it's the same with, um, with, how, with uh, you know, I said university professors, because that's what we do. When I first started, until, until the mid, until the mid to late 80s, the way we, we would write papers, our research is that we write it longhand, we hand it in, and, and a week later you get it from uh, a secretary, you check, you send it back, it comes back to you. Uh, now who writes papers with uh, longhand on pieces of paper? You know, there's all those beautiful pens sitting unused there on our, on our, on our desks because we all type it on, uh, on laptops. And again, it's a kind of restructuring. You know, the typist job has been lost, but it doesn't mean that... Uh, because we don't use it anymore, but then we use something else. We change the tasks that, that we do. Now, we don't know much about what's coming with automation in the next few years because we don't know which sectors are going to be hit mainly. Each new innovation will put different kinds of jobs at risk. What, what, what we do know about is, is the key is the data and whether you have the data there to analyze and reach decisions, and therefore the jobs that are at most threat are the ones that work in predictable environments in, in the sense that um, you don't get hit by a shock that um, takes you completely by surprise. You, you make decisions on the basis of what you know uh, day in, day out, and eventually what you know will be put onto a cloud and, and the decision will be made by a machine because it can be downloaded that data can be downloaded and, and, and analyzed, you know, the way that chess has been uh, automated, for example. It's because you can program a computer what moves are possible, and the computer just processes those moves and comes up with a decision about the next uh, move. That, that's as far as uh, we know. Now, what's very often um, neglected in, in all this analysis is that there is also an economic decision behind the replacement of a job by a robot or artificial intelligence because, I mean, robots are expensive. They need maintenance. They use a lot of electricity. And, um, and uh, people might be cheaper to use there. I was shocked, in fact, only, only two days ago. I heard how much... Uh, how expensive it is if you use Bitcoin to pay for something. There was, there was someone who, who, who works in the um, financial industry and, and he said he wanted to tell, you, you know you can get a Bitcoin, Bitcoin wallet where you can pay for anything on your phone, on your smartphone. He said he paid for a $4 coffee using his Bitcoin wallet and calculated how much electricity was used to put the transaction on blockchain, and it cost $26. <laughs> <laughs> so, so obviously, uh, but that's because he didn't have to pay that $26, and that's why he did it. Now, obviously, if you have a proper economic calculation there, you will say that you, are, you cannot use bitcoins to transact for anything other than uh, you know, thousands and above or something because of the electricity that is used. And that's why you have all these establishments going to... Um, to countries that subsidize electricity and countries that are cold because electricity, they're all in Mongolia and Iceland, I think, and places like that, which is another form of artificial intelligence in, um, or at least in, um, in finance, fintech has called. Um, so we have to bear that in, um, in, in mind. Now, what about um, studying? You know, if we want to study all these things, if we want to model them, how, and that, that's really addressed to, uh, to new, to PhDs and assistant professors who are looking for research topics in this area. How, how do you model them? How do you study robotics? I think the most promising approach actually is one that um, uh, uses uh, tasks as the unit of analysis. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, you use the task as the input into the production function. There is some work on that by the MIT 
uh, MIT team, Otto uh, Asimoglu Restrepo, uh, I haven't seen much as formal work using that, although informally many people talk about tasks. So almost everyone, in fact, that goes into this area talks about tasks. So I was thinking about it before coming, given that this is an ISA day as well, where um, the last 20 years, it's amazing how labor economics changed in the last 20 years and the, the research that um, circulates in discussion papers, which I highly recommend, of course, to everyone. I, I, do, I do read them, especially the way you send five at a time. It's wonderful. <laughs> in contrast to CPI, I send you about 30 at a time, and when you reach number six or seven, you give up. Um, there, there is a parallel here to the way that um, we developed matching theory a, a long time ago. In, I mean, the traditional way that uh, labor economics uh, was done, say, in the 1960s up to 70s, was the, the, the input into the production function was employment. It was hours of work, if you like. You know, you break up employment into small, indivisible units, and then you analyze that as, uh, as the employment input. But when, it, when unemployment became a problem and we started thinking about unemployment, there was no way we could think about unemployment. And we, we didn't know how to, how to make the mapping then was how to go from hours to unemployment. And that's why we had theories like the Lucas Wrapping uh, Intertemporal Substitution, which was really a theory about um, allocation of hours of work of, over time. And then they were presenting that as work on unemployment because they were saying when hours of work go down, therefore unemployment will go up. But by how much and how do you know? You know, it, it wasn't possible to make that connection between hours and unemployment. And, and the key breakthrough there was to abandon employment as the input into the production function and think of a job as the input. Once you think of job as the unit of measurement, then you can talk about job search, you can talk about uh, job matching because then, and, and therefore you can talk about unemployment. It's the job, it's the person that doesn't find a job, is the, un, the unemployed one. And, and once you make that realization, then you open up uh, research um, uh, horizons that, that you can work in. And the same can be done here. Now here using, in the case of robotics, using the job as a unit of analysis is not very useful because of what I said about tasks. So what is, What's more useful here is to say what tasks are being taken over by capital, essentially, the, the new technology. But then there is a tricky step that we didn't have to face in the, the case of uh, jobs and, un and unemployment. And the tricky step here is that we still don't know how to think about the job as a collection of tasks. You know, think of the bank, bank teller as the example. How would you have thought? Would anyone have thought that 20 years ago that the bank teller wouldn't be cashing checks, but um, would be talking to you, would be trying to uh, increase the customer uh, connection, if you like, between the connection the customer and the bank, so that you stay there uh, forever. Um, so that's what, that's what we need research over the next 20 years in ISA Day. Maybe it won't be done by you and me, but we <laughs> maybe it will, who knows? <laughs> It would be good. Okay, job, job, job creation now. Um, now, there, there is no doubt that we're going to work fewer hours in the future, and that's a good thing, because we're going to have more leisure time. Now, there's a quotation by Keynes that he made in a, in a little article that he wrote in 1933 about the economic, the economic future of our grandchildren, he said which is remarkable for someone who never had children and never intended to have children, to write something about his grandchildren. But anyway, maybe he's like the Chinese, you jump the middle step and you go, to, <laughs> you, you, you go two steps further. And, and he said that, uh, that because of new technology, we have to work only 15 hours, each one of us, a week, if employment is going to be maintained. Now, of course, what he had in mind was the um, unavailability of jobs, whereas what we're talking about here is not unavailability, it's more a choice of leisure time, that we just work less, because when you become wealthy, you, you use the, uh, your wealth to increase your consumption of leisure as well as goods. Is that what we learn? Why <laughs> you're doubting me? Anyway, that's, that's there. Now, you, you'd be surprised, actually. I, I, love, I love showing the, the graph that is coming. So overall employment is going to go down then, that with, and we can see that in, in a cross-section very uh, clearly. 
I, I really love this, uh, this graph, and you can see why I highlight it. Look, look at the European countries, which is the, the most hardworking country in Europe, which one is it? It's the, one, the other is Greece, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and which is the laziest country in Europe? <laughs> it's Germany. And, um, and everyone else is, is in between. Korea, Korea, Koreans work harder than Greeks, but, but they are not ordinary people, the Koreans. They work too hard, they, have too much, they do too much research, too many robots. They have most robots in the world, and they also work longest hours in the world. I mean, it's, it, it's remarkable. Maybe it's not the right country to keep mentioning, actually, today. I'm sorry about that, <laughs> South Korea. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm not British, so don't blame me. <laughs> I'm not going to have the reactions of the British press. Um, and, um, and, but of course, this is uh, conditional on, on employment, you know, for working people work hard. And, and, and the reason Greeks work such long hours is because when you ask a Greek who sits in his little shop selling souvenirs on the islands, how many hours do you work? They say, well, you know, I come to the I come to the job around 10 in the morning and I stay here until midnight because that's when the tourists come. So this decision enters 14 hours work during that day, you know. And that's how you end that. But, but, there, but there is a very good correlation if you uh, do it across countries. Uh, Ireland is an outlier because um, what's productivity is measured by dividing GDP by employment. But of course, that's not Irish GDP. It's GDP of the multinationals that are there. It's, yeah, it's Apple and, and, and I don't know who this Google there, Starbucks, you know, one of these. They, they have lots of multinationals that the income is registered as, um, as domestic output in Ireland, but in fact, the income is immediately exported somewhere, somewhere else. Um, and, um, and, and this is by, you know, I just talked about that. It's the kind of idea of job sharing. I mean, like in Germany, uh, average hours of work are 26 per week, but of course, full-time people work more, but uh, part-time employment, especially since the recession uh, it, it exploded, well, since the Hartz reforms, I should say, surely Hartz reforms exploded. Um, and uh, the new feature in labor markets that needs um, more empirical work is that um, whereas part-time work used to be almost exclusively a, a, a female uh, employment sector, now it's becoming a male employment sector as well. Many men are taking uh, voluntarily part-time work and it would be interesting to know um, how they allocate uh, time in their, uh, their day. And of course, there are time use surveys, which we used a lot here as well before, that probably give you that information. Um, now, again, employment is not necessarily less. Okay, so let's talk about the job creation a little bit more. Specifically, the job, the, there, there will be three types of jobs that come out of here. The one is that, is that um, employ, companies will invent new tasks, which you can think of as, um, as, as, product, as more product diversity, you know, is the increasing the variety of products, service products that are being offered. Then, of course, new jobs will be created in the sectors of the new technologies like app developments, robot repairing, etc. You know, these are the technical jobs. But the majority of jobs will be created in other sectors of the economy, which are the social and emotional sectors like cares for children, for old people, for pets. And I'm sorry, that's another Korean example. That's from my kids, the plastic surgeons in Korea. It has, it's one of the fastest growing professions in the country with the way that they spend um, their, their money. Uh, given how much they they make. Okay, so the first two types that I mentioned before, I mean, the, I mean, the assumption is that they are not enough to replace all the jobs that have been taken over. They are, um, but they are like new products. You know, we can think of it as increasing product variety, where by product here we mean uh, mainly services. Um, the um, majority of jobs will come from uh, new sectors. Now you have, um, Two, two types of um, forces, if you like, that shift you onto the new sectors. The one, to do a little bit of self-advertising as well, is the, the work uh, that I did with Rachel and Guy on, uh, on the sectoral allocation of labor when technology affects different sectors differently. That, that employment, the jobs are being created in the sectors that have the lowest uh, pr uh, productivity rates of growth. Uh, the reason being that uh, there is less subsidiability at the output level. You know, again, it's the extreme example is where you, 
you consume services in manufacturing goods in equal proportions, then if there is a productivity shock in manufacturing, labor will move to services to increase the service output so that you maintain the proportions. There's going to be a lot of um, growth coming from there in job creation because of demand for output of uh, goods of sectors that have low productivity growth. There is going to be a lot of marketization of um, home production because as we become wealthier, we move, production out in, we move uh, home production out into the market. You know, think of, uh, of uh, home cleaning, for example. The, if the society becomes wealthier, then it pays cleaners, professional cleaners to come into the job. Uh, or, I think that Richard Rogerson has been emphasizing a lot that there are goods that have income elasticities bigger than one, and as our incomes grow through the new technology, we're going to increase demand for outputs there. Now, it's difficult to empirically distinguish between um, the marketization of home production and the elasticity, income elasticity generally. I don't think that's, that's a problem. In fact, I think marketization of home production is probably more important than uh, a genuine luxury good. But it's not all that important. I think that's probably Freeman, Richard Freeman and others would probably agree with what I just said since they initiated it some time ago. Um, but that's, the, that, that's where jobs are going to uh, come from. Now, which sectors satisfy that, um, that cr those criteria that I've given you? Well, health and care is the main one, and that's the one I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, later on. The education sector doesn't get many productivity shocks in terms of growth, and it is um, a, a bit of a sort of luxury good, if you like. Hos the hospitality industry is going to be important, mainly because of the... Um, reduction in hours of work that I've shown, and also the fact that um, you don't get a productivity rise in hospitality. What I mean by hospita hospitality includes uh, theater, sports, um, hotels, catering. You, you don't get new technology there, although the re restaurants actually in Asia are beginning to get it. I hope it doesn't spread to Europe where you never see a person who's all down on the uh, iPad. If you don't have an iPad when you walk in, you find one on your table and you order, you pay, you do everything on iPad. It, I, I tried it when I was in, um, in Hong Kong, actually, I tried it, and I, it's extremely boring. It, it's, it's really like going to a restaurant just to feed yourself and get out, <laughs> which is not the idea of going to a restaurant. <laughs> Whoever thought of food when they go to a restaurant are just feeding themselves. And household services and personal services. Now, um, now, health and care, of course, has the other feature that we have aging societies, and that will create uh, more, uh, the need for more jobs. The le leisure industry, because of uh, fewer aggregate hours, I think those two are going to be most important. And then household services, real estate management, those are because of um, wealthier societies and marketization, dog walking, you know, pet care, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, let's talk. Is, is, is it 10 o'clock, I suppose, this on the program? Or, uh, Okay, let, let, let me talk, I mean, the, the, the health and care case is quite interesting, actually, because the, um, of what you will see in the data that I'm going to show you against some graphs. Um, the, um, I mean, health and care will grow, it, it's, it's partly a kind of luxury, you know, like, like if you're poor and you have back pain, you, you don't do anything about it, you just complain, usually to your spouse, but anyway, generally complain to your friends. If you're wealthy, you discover all kinds of exercises and activities and specialists that you're going to see. And in fact, one of the main, one, it, w there are two main reasons for absenteeism in the British labor market, from what I know. One is back pain and the other is depression. Well, they, 50 years ago, there was nothing. That's why they've been, so, and, and it's because of people marketizing these things. It's not that people never got depressed 50 years ago or, or never had back pain. So the health and care has that feature that we demand these services with, with increased living standards. It, and, and then it has the feature of, uh, of population aging. And if you look, uh, again, across countries, how much they spend as a percent of their GDP against their GDP per capita, you can, you can see a very good um, cross-country correlation, I guess. Well, when it comes to health spending, of course, the United States has to be an outlier. It, it's a mystery how much they spend on health uh, and how they accept it, but you can see you, it's even much bigger of an outlier in later things I'm going to show. 
and um, then when you see spending across, uh, no, no, when you see the employment implications of what I've just shown across countries, that, that's where you see where job creation prospects come. Once again, the, uh, the, the worst countries are, in terms of employment in the health sector, are Greece, Poland, uh, Latvia, Chile actually is not European, I think. Um, and, um, and the most populous uh, sectors are in the Scandinavians, you know, but when you compare, like Norway, and, uh, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, Netherlands, which in most cases behaves like a Scandinavian country, in fact, in the in, in, in labor market, they have something between 15 and 20 percent of the labor force in the health and care sector. Go to Southern Europe, and they have something between 5 and 8 percent in the health and care sector, with the others in the middle. So if you look at the prospects for job creation in, in those countries, you, at, you're talking up to about 10 percentage points of employment being um, absorbed into this sector. And, and effectively, that will solve their employment problems <laughs> if, you, if, if they could, you know, like if, we, if you could get Southern European countries and, you know, Greece and, and East European to get their health and care sector organized the way the Scandinavians have it, then you immediately solve all their unemployment problems in Spain, in Greece, in, um, in the employment, low employment in, in Eastern Europe. And, and I think it's coming. And, and that, that gap that you have there is enough to uh, re-employ re almost all the people who lose their jobs to artificial in intelligence and uh, robotics. Now, you might say, how do we do that? You know, well, you have to sort of find ways of training people who are now taxi drivers, say, to make them uh, look at the nursing profession as a respectable professional that they can do instead of driving their cars around town. I mean, it's a challenge, but uh, we had such challenges in the past. I, you know, the Luddites being the most famous ones, where they gave up on the challenge and they said, we don't like these machines. Um, but I, we haven't seen destruction of robots yet. And then we have the aging of populations. You can see the aging here. Again, you, I mean, you know, it's well known that Japan has the biggest problem. Germany, actually, is only second to Japan of the major economies in terms of uh, aging problems. I have no idea why suddenly German population becomes younger from 2040 onwards, maybe. <laughs> oh, the, oh, I see. And they, but this is the prospect of admitting new immigration or the ones that are already here. We'll have children. Oh, I see, okay. Well, so maybe Mrs. Merkel is not... Uh, maybe, maybe she has a point there when she talks about immigration. <laughs> oh, no. But uh, that's a chapter I don't want to open, <laughs> please. Um, and the United States is in a good... Um, it is in a, in a good position of the advanced countries. I mean, it, it, I, mean, I mean, the Chinese problem here, obviously, is the one-child policy, which they have now abandoned. You can see what they just shot up. Um, and then again, if you do a, a cross-country correlation between the old age depen dependency ratio and health spending, I mean, the United States is, really is an outlier there, despite the absence of uh, aging population. You can see Japan that is the outlier, but, but it is an outlier on the line, whereas the U.S. Is just, it just spends far more than uh, justified by any criterion if you, look, if you do this on a cross-section. So obviously what's, doing, what's causing that in the U.S. is something other than old age dependency, old age or level of development. Now finally, very, very briefly, because I want to talk about education since uh, we talked about policy. Uh, sorry, I want to talk about policy. The first policy is education, of course, and, and you do need to have the technical skills and the management, set up the new companies, the startups that would be successful. We haven't been very successful in Europe in that. There, and the Swedish... Sweden, in fact, has been the most successful country in Europe with startups, with Spotify and various other things, followed by Germany, and, and, and that's what's known as STEM. I've just argued for the hospitality industry, the leisure industry, and that's ours, and that becomes STEAM. The first time I saw STEAM being referred to, I thought it was a, a typo, and I crossed out A and <laughs> joined up E and M, but it's not a typo. Person-to-person um, -person skills are going to be very important because we talked about social and emotional skills that, uh, that will be needed and our schools are not good at teaching those. 
job creation support policies, we, they range from support for SMEs, that is absolutely essential, uh, simplifying legal procedures, social policies to support people when they take transition, bankruptcy shouldn't be looked at as a stigma in the way they do in Silicon Valley is a joke. When you go bankrupt, you go bankrupt, and you go to the bar to explain to your friends how you managed to, what a great idea you had, and it turned out to be a complete failure. I think we should start looking at it that way. Although, although I hear they're becoming more secretive now in, uh, in, in revealing the great ideas because we're running out of ideas. And then universities and how to, um, to um, how to increase collaboration between industry and universities that uh, have done so well in uh, California and, um, and, and around Boston, but not very successful here. Although, again, it, it, I thought it was a limit to how much graphs I want to show you. I mean, the country that has the best collaboration between universities and industries is Germany, in fact, despite the, the low profile of German universities compared, say, with the British ones. The British are notoriously bad uh, in collaboration between universities and industry. They go more for the classics and the abstract, I guess. <laughs> um, inequality, now, now the problem with inequality, I mentioned it briefly before. I, I mean, this is something that if you talk about redistributed taxation, it's almost like a dirty word. You say, you know, tell us something new kind of thing. But, but the thing is that there is no alternative to find some kind of redistribution, however it's done. And the way it's done in Scandinavia and countries where the taxation is used to uh, subsidized jobs in sectors like the health and care, I think is probably most acceptable, but for that to work, you need to have trust in the government that is going to do a good job with it, which is what's lacking in places like Italy and Greece. If we go by the Benedetti service, for example, that Tito Boeri did a few years ago, there's just, if you don't trust your government that they're going to spend the money well, then obviously you don't want to pay taxes and you start going into the process of tax evasion and voting down governments that might say they have these programs that need funding. Um, and finally, it's the perception of jobs that I mentioned briefly before that you have to, to do in the transition, that you have to do things like persuading tax drivers that nursing is a good profession and many others. Now, you might say, how do you do it? But there are examples. My, my best example, actually, of, of changing perception of jobs is, uh, is cooking. Not so long ago, it wasn't considered to be a good job to be what was known as a cook. The word chef existed only in France. You know, you were a cook and you worked in a, in a dirty, hot, sweaty environment. It wasn't good. Now, there are no cooks. There are chefs and, and, and you are a TV personality and, and you write books and you have columns in newspapers. It's a complete change in the perception of the job and with that comes a difference in pay and respectability of the job, and therefore many people want to do that job. There are kids in school where their ambition is to become uh, chefs because they see all the uh, publicity chefs get, which is a good thing because if, if, I mean, okay, we know that pay has to be connected with productivity, but how do you measure the productivity of a chef? You know, if everyone likes the profession and they like what they're doing, then um, they get paid more. It's like the equivalent to an increase in productivity. Same goes with drivers, although they are being uh, taken over by robots, but you, you have chauffeurs instead of uh, drivers. It, 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 it changes, it, and that's the reason we have that, is because we're changing the perception of the job again. And the same needs to be done with, you know, sports people now are, are uh, things that they all want to do because the rewards are so high. Um, and, um, and and that's a way forward in a way that the, that the social, the jobs connected with social and emotional skills need to be thought of as better and better paying and uh, because that's where jobs will be created and that's where people will, be, will want to go to, to enter. So in conclusion, there you go, that we're going to have a rise in productivity, society will be wealthier and that will need lead to a restructuring of jobs, although there would be more leisure time, there would be new types of jobs <laughs> come along, and as far as in parallel what economic research in the direction that um, I see, the most useful direction that I see is going would be to develop theories based on tasks and then connect tasks to the jobs to see where the job distribution and the employment distribution in the economy is going to uh, come from. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris, for this uh, very stimulating uh, talk. Uh, we weren't sure whether we would um, have a couple of minutes left for allowing for questions or comments, but since we still have five minutes, I think we should take the opportunity yes, to, uh, um, to, to uh, collect comments or, or questions, if that's possible. Yes, please. Yeah, I, I, I doubt actually because if you look at the history, I'm in the, I mean, one of my very first visits to the United States was in the 1980s when I went to Princeton and, uh, and I was talking very much to Orly Aschenfeld at the time. And, and it's when the big, uh, the big videotapes were around that time. Where were called V8, I think something like that. And he was saying to me, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be writing books anymore. You know, we should all be recording our lectures on these videotapes because that's where the future is. And instead of books, we'll be selling tapes and, and no one will be going to classes and all that. And yet, and yet it hasn't happened. It's, um, it, it might be surprising. I mean, people, students still want the personal contact, like, like at the LSE, at least, and I'm sure in most other places. You can watch the lecture online the day it's given because it's always recorded. But students don't do it; they still turn up at the lecture theatre and listen. So, so you don't need to despair. You know, maybe maybe the next generation, our generation, the generation that I see in the room at least, if not ours. Yes, Michael, please. Yeah, that, that, yeah that, that's true. I mean, what, what I talked about, the sectoral allocation, the sectoral allocation of, uh, of work, of course, depends on the price elasticities. You could put it in a way that depends on the price elasticities. It, it, it's, uh, I mean, it's another thing, identifying the, I mean, obviously the goods that have the highest price elasticities would be the ones that would attract, um, it, with the new technology going there, prices would fall, there would be a lot more demand, and then jobs will not be destroyed, will remain in the sectors. Yeah, high elasticity, you get less uh, outflow. Guess, do you have any guess, like which sectors those are too? That's the interesting question. Well, you need, yeah, I mean, you need, you need to know which sectors have the, uh, have the high elasticity. It's, diff it's, it's difficult to think of sectors, actually, with high elasticity. I think the, I think the, I think the ultimate limiting factor, actually, in, in consumption is, is time. Any, any, anything, any good that requires time to consume, inevitably, will have low elasticity of <laughs> demand. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, if, I mean, how many cars can you have, for example? You, know, you need to get in and drive them. Therefore, if price falls and falls, you still buy one car, maybe two, and that's it, yeah. I thought, yes. Um, you said that um, part-time work will be a male work in the future, and you said that social and emotional work will be, should be better paid. How is that possible? Well, well you see, one... I mean, what I said about respectability of the jobs, social acceptance and respectability, influences pay because the, 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 uh, you, see, you see, the problem with pay, the, the way we think of pay as economists and we say, how can you pay them more if they're unproductive is when productivity is low. But how, how do you measure the productivity of that? You know, I mean, take a, I mean, take a mental um, uh, worker, you know, it's someone who, is a, who deals with people that have mental disturbances. How, how do you measure the productivity of that person? How much they get paid is how much the person that has the problem, or if it's um, people who are, depend on others, if you like their parents or their guardians, are prepared to pay. Now, if the service they're providing is, is good quality and there's some appreciation, then their pay would, would be higher. So in a way, you know, because you, don't me you cannot measure the productivity of those jobs, their pay is not restricted by 
the, product, the conventional productivity measurement, but there's a big range that in societies where those jobs are considered to be important, then pay will be higher simply because people are prepared to, to pay them, <laughs> if you see what I mean. You know, I know it's, it's not very technical language that I'm using, but, but you can see how it's happening. I mean, it's the same, you know, it's the same with, the, with restaurants and waiters or with personal trainers. Why are some personal tra trainers so expensive? You know, they tell you how to move, you can get it on the internet, you can do it, I mean, because you get a service which you accept is a good job, it makes you feel better at the end of the day, and, and because we live in wealthy societies, people are prepared to pay much more money to someone who makes them feel better. That's how you do it. I have one, final that well. I have one final remark by Thomas, and then we will go for the coffee break. Especially the healthcare sector and medicine um, is more hit by robotics and artificial intelligence than many other kind of sectors. You see it in Japan. Robotics in Japan is um, developed so fastly because they don't want to have immigration in order to do healthcare. Uh, so they are counting on robotics. In Germany, you see that more and more robots go into healthcare facilities. Or in medicine, that uh, doctors increasingly specialized, but as uh, if they specialize more and more, their mm -hmm. jobs can be taken over by uh, uh, robots. So mm -hmm. there are operational robots nowadays who do whole operations uh, yeah. and basically are substituting physicians. Well, I, I think here we have to draw the distinction between health, which doesn't employ that many people actually because it's completely mechanized in care, which is more the nursing care, the care of old people. When I say care, I also mean childcare and um, care. And, um, and, and although I do think uh, there will be more um, automation in diagnosis especially and, uh, and operations, I mean, I've, you know, we, we've all seen it, I don't know. I've, you know I, I mean, I have been to do general uh, health checkups where there's only one person in 20 machines <laughs> circling around me, you know. That, that aspect is, is, is obviously automated. But I, that's why I said before, despite reports in the newspapers that we read about Japan, I, I don't see the, the nursing uh, care and, and taking care of older people and younger people and those in need be mechanized. I mean, you might say, how do you believe it? But, there are surveys where I ask parents, they ask parents, would you trust your child to a robot that if there is something wrong, they, you get a phone call or that the driverless car taking your child to, to school and they always say no. You, you, you trust a, a person much more. I mean, some, I can see the applications in some. For example, um, I think there is a device around now which, uh, which monitors breathing. So if, say, an older person lives alone, then you put that next to the bed. If they sense some irregularity in the breathing, it, it sends a signal to the hospital and the uh, doctor comes alone. Th that kind of thing, I, I, I see it because I have seen uh, night nurses <laughs> with, with old people, people you know, in the family and all that, and, and, and essentially they just sit in a chair in the room uh, for 10 hours at, at night and and, and they are such boring jobs that I, I hope they do become mechanized, actually, the, the, that aspect. But I don't see it as a general trend uh, going in there, given, um, g given the way people think, given the desires they have to be looked after by a real person, you know, both children and... Uh, and, and, and also, of course, something I didn't mention before is that although, although robots can do wonderful things, they can only do one thing at a time. And, and the person who looks after your child, for example, is also a, a teacher, it is one who teaches the child language, manners, feeds the child, you know, it, 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 this, this multitasking -task, is not possible apparently with artificial intelligence. And, and, and I did hear people saying it will not be, technically it will not, not be possible for the next 50 years at least, where, you know, the favorite British example is that the, you know, they, they might beat you in chess, but if you want a cup of tea, they won't get up and make you, <laughs> you know, the robots. 
Thank you very much, uh, Chris. That's a good um, catchword because now it's the coffee break and you are given the chance to behave like humans, engage in conversation and uh, think about what would happen if we were only robo robots that would uh, be sent to a coffee break. That would not work out, I guess. So I think chances for... Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much.